So you guys should all have to leave now if you don't want to be recorded on your screen. And um, welcome. It is March 14th. Happy Pi Day again to everybody. And um, tonight we're going to kind of continue our equity discussion. Um, I'm going to use a version of a, a slideshow that I, I have in different parts of our um, I have in different parts of our course, but I wanted to kind of speak to it a little more tonight. And what I'm hoping that we can do when we do breakout at time is time to talk about really what this information, what this data means to you in your specific role at your specific school. And I also wanted to take some of the time to talk about the difference between gifted identification and the choices that we are making as educators when we decide which students are taking what courses. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping to accomplish for the, for the evening, for sure. Um, I'm going to throw a capture sheet in here. Maybe I'm not going to throw a capture sheet in here. Let's try this again. All right, I think I put a capture sheet in the chat. I'm sure y'all will let me know if that worked or not. I don't know what to it share. says we need access to the document. Oh, right. If you're not logged in, it's only available for MCPS. So hold on one second. Um, I was able to open it. Yeah, if you're logged into your MCPS Google account, um, do this real quick. And it should force a copy. That's that's the intention of it. One with the link. So if you need to try refreshing your page now, and hopefully you will be able to see it now. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I do realize that a lot of the stuff I have, the way it's said, is you need to be logged into MCPS in order to access it. Um, so I'm making changes as, as I go. And I'll try and remember to pop that in the chat as we go along. Um, so Right now, um, we're going to talk a little bit about COMAR. I know this was in our first unit where we really talked about what the state regulations say. Um, but now I want to put together what the state regulation says with the MCPS data and then kind of break that also down to what does that look like for your school and how do you find that information to help you understand decisions which are being made. Um, I think. I'm hoping that as we go through this, um, use the capture sheet to kind of take down notes, but also write down questions. And then um, I always think that having those questions really can help frame the next part of our discussion, which is where we're going, where we can get more into the um, really, again, with it, how, it, how it plays out to you and, and your daily work. Um, so we know COMAR is the <clears throat> Code of Maryland. and <clears throat> um, COMAR was last updated for gifted education in 2019. So this is very new data. It's very relevant, very relevant legally speaking. Um, one thing that we have been very blessed to have is the gifted instructional specialist for the state um, until I think last Friday, I think he retired last Friday. But the person that we've had for the last 10 or so years is also has, was twice exceptional himself, is twice exceptional himself. And so he's done a really great job of making sure that twice exceptional students are recognized throughout the law, um, as well as other special populations. That's really an area of, of my interest, his interest. And so even before I became involved in any of this, Maryland was putting twice exceptional into our state law. And I think that that is um, really important for us to know. So when you see the little ellipses here where it says potential ability achievement, blah, 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 
that blah, blah, blah covers the special populations and it goes into more detail about where we anticipate finding our students and where we should look for them. Um, so the universal screening piece is important because we know that best practices tell us that if we rely only on um, teacher recommendations, parent recommendations, or opting in for identification, we are more likely to miss our underrepresented populations, including twice exceptional and um, our black and brown students are the ones who are most frequently left out. So prior to 2018 in MCPS, for students to be identified as gifted, um, initially it was a teacher or parent recommendation. They would ask to have them screened. And then for a brief period of time, we would send home a note saying, would you like your child to be screened? And then the parents would have to respond in the affirmative. One thing that the universal screening law gave us is that we say, essentially, we are screening all kids unless you want your child opted out. And so by having that opt out instead of opt in, it eliminates a huge those who know barrier. You know, we, you all know, we all know, and CPS is a beast to to understand and to wrangle and to get information when you know what you're looking for. So for parents who don't know or don't know what they're looking for, who might not be used to questioning or seeking out that information within the school system, if we don't, if we make it hard for them, their kids are going to be the ones that suffer and, they, and often unknowingly because they didn't know they were supposed to ask in the first place. So by going with this universal screening process, um, that is one of the ways that we have started to eliminate barriers. Um, another piece of that universal screening, um, it says 10% in each local school system, and it actually goes further to say 10% of each school in a school system. Um, it, it varies a little bit depending on how you're interpreting the law. We are given the ability for special schools specifically um, for schools with our, our most impacted students, we are not required to meet that 10% um, identification mark. And that's something that is some of the nitty gritty of what we do. But generally it's telling us that we wanna identify 10% of our school system. Um, we need to do that first round of identification prior to third grade. It varies in Maryland. Um, Baltimore City starts as early as kindergarten. Um, Prince George's County starts in first grade, and it varies from there. We start our universal screening in second grade, um, and that's been pretty standard. And then the other thing that this law brought in is that we have to do additional screenings. They don't have to be universal, but we do have to do additional screenings sometime in grades three through five and sometime in grades six through nine. Um, so our middle schoolers, that's where one of those big changes has happened for you guys is State law starting in 19 said that we need to identify. So we now use seventh grade as our identifying year. Um, if you want to know the background as to why we picked the grades that we did, that's another lecture for another day, but I'm happy to answer those questions. But essentially what we've determined is we do universal screening in grade two. We do further screening in grade three. We do further screening in grade five. And then we do our final screening in grade seven. And throughout all those time periods, we're using multiple data points, multiple indicators. What does that mean? It means that we look at different things in order to identify our students. We might look at performance data. Unfortunately, right now we primarily look at performance data, um, but we also use um, formalized checklists for parents and for teachers so that we get input. Uh, staff members can advocate for students so if a student is being screened or in that screening period. You can fill out um, the advocacy form for a student, and we go through this process of identifying them. There's also, for our twice exceptional students, another pathway that we can use. And this other pathway is one that doesn't get talked about very frequently, but we do have a pathway for any student who has been given a, um, a test such as the WISP to be identified. And I've talked about this before. Um, but if a special education team, a 504 team, is screening a student for their purposes, and they have a document, um, testing document that has a 120 or higher for the um, full scale IQ or a 120 or higher for the general abilities index, they can submit that to my office essentially. And then we 
to go through a different process where we look over the student's paperwork, we review the documents that are submitted, and then we can identify the student as well. Um, that's a part that we want to make sure that we're getting out there because a lot of the points that we're using right now in our universal screening are not the points where our place exceptional kids shine. And so we really need an additional um, piece to attack that. Yes, Ashley. Can you talk a little bit more about what that process looks like if some uh, data comes back that indicates that score range and how um, it should be communicated to your office? So every school, great question. So every elementary and middle school has a person. In no, elementary school, it is your GT liaison. Your GT liaison is not a release position. It is usually going to be your staff development teacher, assistant principal, sometimes a reading specialist, rarely somebody else. But those are usually like the main people that end up holding this position. Um, in, the, in middle schools, it is your AEIST, which is your accelerated and support, uh, accelerated and rich instruction support teacher. Um, and that is a release position, although in multiple schools right now, um, it's still the staff development teacher, but in other schools, it is a point four that is being utilized for that. And through the training they receive, they have a link to that process. So essentially what the process is, and I'm hoping to simplify this next year, is that you fill out a Google form, you explain what test is being presented, is used, is it the list, is it any of the other ones that I don't remember right now. Um, you know, what type of meeting was it that you reviewed this? If it's an outside report, um, you fill out the team outside report form, and then you attach all of that to the Google form and hit submit. And it goes to the uh, identification specialist in our office. Nine times out of 10, if it is a twice exceptional kid, it's then forwarded to me. I read it, unless I read it already and told you guys to submit it. Um, and then I, I do a review of the information that's in there and we either ask for more information or more often than not, I say, yes, this is appropriate. This is what we're looking at. And then from there, we flip a switch. I'm gonna say we click a button in Synergy to identify the student as gifted and a letter is drafted and sent to the parent saying that they have been identified as gifted. Um, that's the nuts and bolts of it. My, my plan in streamlining it next year is to one, put more training out for our psychologists because usually that, is, that information is either being done by them or reviewed by them. And then also making it more clear about like what information. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of unsureness right now about like other forms to fill out. And my goal is to eliminate those forms because again, we want to eliminate barriers for identification. We don't want to over identify in that we are weakening what it is we're looking for, but we want to um, generously identify in that we don't want barriers in place for not for missing students who should not be missed. Does that mostly answer the question, Ashley? It did, thank you. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to also start with the caveat that all of my data is from 2018-19, so it's all pre-pandemic. At the end of this year is the next time I'm going to pull data. I specifically have not pulled data because we, between the pandemic and post-pandemic, we went through a big change in our screening process. Um, as many of people probably know, we no longer give the COGAT. Um, that is also another discussion for another day, um, but the COGAD is not being used as our cognitive abilities test for student um, ability. We've been using a slightly different for, uh, process right now, and then I don't know what we're doing next year, but because it's been three years since the pandemic and all that, I'm going to pull new data at the end of the school year. Yes, Lisa. Okay, I just uh, wanted to clarify because just as you were talking about um, the criteria and then the process for identifying students um, kind of after the fact of they've taken the assessments, processing speed is not something that we're considering um, with giftedness. 
just be, I'm asking, cause I do have a student who was average or low average in, in pretty much everything on the WISC except her processing speed was like at a 134, like the coding and the digits. Is that something that's considered gifted? Are we looking at, are we looking at other criteria? So I'm gonna say we, we would look at other criteria. Okay. But I would I would caveat that with if they're coming out average, low average, because you know, we we looked at I think early on, you know, you can have like a very low score and a superior score and they come out as average, but it's not average, it's a spike, it's a low spike, high spike. So mm -hmm. if, if that's the reason it's coming out average, low average, and the processing speed is that fast then maybe there's something there. The processing speed on its own, what it's kind of telling us is they're processing information really quickly, but they're not necessarily processing it at a depth or complexity that we would look at in a twice exceptional student. Um, and it's kind of the same with the working memory piece. You know, they might be able to hold a lot of information in their head, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're then manipulating that information and making connections and, and doing that exploration of, of thinking that we would look at normally with a gifted twice exceptional student. Um, I, that, and I hesitate, like I said, because if there's spikes in those subtest scores, we don't want to eliminate students, but that's also why we look at the full scale or the GAI, because the GAI mostly cuts out working memory and processing speed, because we know those are areas of more often than not areas of impact. I'll take a look at the, the GIA. She did have, um, you know, she did, because I, I just pulled it up while, while you were presenting. Um, and and she does, she comes out, um, I mean, other than, she's not she's not super hilly in her, her scores. I mean, she has that one high processing speed and everything else, is is like pretty is pretty average for her but um you know and then you know she's got kind of a cluster of things that are low average and then a cluster of things that are kind of in the average range so she's not like you know spiking up and down like a heartbeat or something like that um you know in terms of her thing and and like i said what's really high for her is that processing but I'm not sure, and I and I know her as a, I know her as a student because she's on my caseload, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not I'm not sure if she is doing anything exceptional. I know she likes to do things that are fast, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, I think she likes that she likes that dopamine hit. She likes the kind of just that you know things things to be done fast. But whether there's a method to the madness, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm. I couldn't, I couldn't really say, um, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't get that sense, um, you know, and spending time with her, but I just wanted to, like I said, I just wanted to clarify because, you know, just it, it, it is something that is interesting about her testing is how fast she can code, I guess, um, it was, it was really the coding and some of the digit stuff mm -hmm. that got her up to an elevated, like in the one thirties on her but everything else was pretty much in like upper 80s 90s low low 100s i think yeah and i mean I, that is also a great example of why it's not just a single data point in any direction because you know it's, it's worth having that conversation about um because if we have a student who was presenting that way but then you're like but when you meet her and she's able to do blah 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 but on the testing it's just not showing that's when we want to start digging in for other data points if it's a single data point we want to talk about it but we don't want to make our whole decision based on that one data point right all right okay that that sounds great thanks so much no problem um so as I've had said before, this is MCPS data based on um, 2019. It was the beginning of 2019 when we pulled the data. Um, no, it was September of 2019, I'm sorry, when we pulled this data. And so what we can see here is, you know, per Comar at the time, it, it, this went into a law in J um, July 1st, 2019. So at the time that we started looking at our data, 
our school system meets that 10%. That's what this line here is showing us is this is where 10% is. So we are we're identifying at about 19.3% at this point in our system. Uh, special education, I believe that is about 5%. So only 5% of our students are formally identified as, as gifted for our um, what it was called LEP in, in the setting. Um, those students were identified at 0.7%. Our farm students are, are identified at 10.8%. Title I was just a little below that at like 9 point something percent. And then you can see our um, gender is something that is really interesting to look at when it comes to giftedness um, because like, like in the general population in a twice exceptional population, it tends to be very, very equal. But when we're looking at students who identify as non any type of non-binary, overwhelmingly those students tend to be gifted. And it's a very interesting trend, obviously. This is a newer area of research, but um, it is something, it is a phenomenon that we're seeing. And so I think when you know, we're talking about special populations, underrepresented populations, and then knowing the struggles that our, our LGBTQ plus students have, and then adding the information in along this, um, it's just it's something to kind of keep in mind. I think there, I, I don't have a lot to like dive into deeply about that, but I think it's something that is definitely worth mentioning and exploring. And I can say I have had more and more students every year brought to me who um, are presenting as as non-binary in some way. Um, and showing as gifted. And one of the questions that I've been dealing with, especially recently, has been if a student is, if a student is having, you know, emotional issues and part of it is stemming from the gender, just um, the gender identity pieces, is that a disability um, in terms of, of emotional disability? Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say yes or no, but I think it, it, it adds a new dimension to this conversation that we have not had in previous years, not to the extent that I feel like we're having now. Um, so mostly I just kind of put the gender out there and then slightly to the side because, like I said, it's interesting to talk about, but um, but we don't want to make too many assumptions, I think is what I'm saying. So then the next thing that we did was we broke out our um, population based on, on our race codes. And so again, our gifted ID is at 10%. Um, one thing that I, one thing I on here that to me is usually very, very interesting is not only who is identified, because across the board, we're pretty close to that 10% for every category. The question for me to look at is the other side of it is, you know, are there areas, are there race areas that are over identified? And so it becomes a question. And the next part of that is we want to look at the research. Um, I will add that, you know, something that Matt talked about last week was um, this American Indian and the Pacific Islander populations. Those are very small populations in MCPS. And so I, I worry about over, over patting ourselves on the back or over berating. Um, my favorite example was, you know, when I was at Northwood, 100% of our American Indian population was identified as gifted. And then that student graduated and then 0% of our Native American, American Indian population was identified as gifted because we had nobody. Um, I think for a brief time we had two students. And so we went from 100% to 50%. So when we're looking at those numbers that are that small, we don't want to make too many assumptions again in, in our setting. But for all of our other numbers, um, I think they, these are important to look at. And so again, we can see um, African American is about 15 ish percent. Um, Hispanic Latino is just over 10, it's like 10.8%. Um, Asian multiracial and Caucasian run between 27 and 32% identification. So, 
I think overall, it's not that dissimilar to what Matt showed us last week. Um, it, like I said, it's just it's our population data. And so we want to kind of, I think, continue to dig into that. Um, so when we talk about giftedness and we talk about percentages and, you know, how do we figure out how many, what we're looking at. So we know that the NCPS Comar said 10%. Um, when we look at some of the research and we kind of start to define what is giftedness mean, we have um, one group that we call the highly and profoundly gifted. So the profoundly gifted is the little blue slice up here. This is this less than 1% of the population. These are your people that are very unlikely to meet. Um, these are our nine-year-olds who go to law school kind of kids. We then have our highly gifted kids who make up just less than 2% of the population. Um, we are more likely to have, we do have several of these students in NCPS right now at varying um, schools and varying programs. Being in this top 2% though, does not guarantee or give you any access to any programming in NCPS. And so it's important to know that these kids are out there and they are in our school system and they are more likely to be in your classroom than not than in a program. And so you might have to plan for them when you're considering what am I instructing on and how am I differentiating. So Joseph Renzulli, who also gives us some of the talent development models, um, depending on the research of his you're reading, he ends up identifying that about 12% of the population can be considered gifted. So they're at that 120 or higher mark, depending again on one, what score system you're using. But to me, the really important part is that Renzulli talks about this talent development pool. And so the talent development pool is really looking at your 25%. And these are kids that you might call your bubble kids. They might be kids who are not globally gifted, but gifted in very specific areas, um, or kids who have not had the opportunity to be exposed to what some of our other kids have been exposed to. And so if we develop their talents, as educators and we help them find their strengths, we teach them critical thinking skills, we teach them um, some of those other you know, creativity skills that our students might all, uh, uh, that they may or may not have had access to, they are more likely to perform well or equal to their gifted peers. And so um, to me, that talent development pool is important because one, it tells us that there are kids who need to have access to programming even if they aren't identified as gifted. But then also, um, it brings me back to this column right here. Because if we know that about 25% of our students meet in this talent development pool, if you will, when I think about over-identification, that's when I start to look at this maroon line or whatever random color it was I picked this time. So Comar is down here in pink at 10%. My, my um, Renzulli model, if you will, is at that 12%. And then we have this talent development line at 25%. And we still have those three specific groups, which are over that 25%. And so my question becomes, if research tells us that, you know, for the most part, a pool doesn't go over 25%, if we're identifying students as gifted up here, are we over identifying or and then by by the same discussion, how much are we under identifying? And so when we talk about missingness and some of the articles that were posted um, for the beginning of the equity unit talked about this concept of missingness. And so the missingness is like the who's missing. It's not have we identified 10%. You can see with the one exception of Hawaii, Hawaiian Pacific Islander. We have identified 10% in all of our groups. But the question is, if we're identifying some groups as much as 32%, where are these kids? We know they exist. So where are the kids in here? And so that, to me, becomes our charge as educators as what are we doing to find these kids? What are we doing to address their needs? And then what are we doing to help develop them so that they do pop when we do our, our universal screenings? And 
I don't have it pulled up on this presentation specifically. Um, I do have one where we have it broken down um, subcategories. So we have um, race breakout for special education and race breakout for LEP. And the numbers are, are significantly different. So, um, so that's really kind of what I wanted to bring to us at the start tonight. Um, I will say I have some questions in here. And so I, I'm going to take a pause in a second to see if there's any questions for the group. But the first round of like thinking questions that I have for you guys is, you know, why are some groups over or under identified? I think that based on some of the readings, hopefully you guys have done, it's not so much why are they, but what are we, what are we going to, what are we doing about this? How are we approaching this in our everyday classrooms? Um, does it need to we need, need, mean we need to make changes? Again, I think the obvious answer is yes, something has to change. But again, we want to tease apart like what is it that needs to change? Is it the process that needs to change? Is it the um, depth of data that we use that needs to change? Like what are options that we have that you guys have read about um, that might be a part of that discussion? One thing I think that's really interesting is that in research, they usually will tell us 10%, 12% or rarer, so less than, but MSC says at least. So I, I think talking about the difference in that and what it means and, and how you as a learned educator feel about that phrase, I think it is a really you know, interesting discussion point. Um, and then how does this impact or change your thinking when it comes to either dividing kids into groups if you're when you're doing grouping or making recommendations for students moving forward. Um, I think that's the kind of the first breakout room. I know I have one question up here. I don't know if it's for the whole group or just for me. Um, yes. I won't read that out to the group. I'll just say yes. I need to work with your case manager. Um, but like I said, before we go into the breakout groups, if does anybody have any questions or things they want to bring to the whole group? Could, could you click back like one or two slides? There was, I think there was something on another slide that you showed. Okay, so uh, the pie chart. Yes. Okay, so you said like the little teal part was like your nine-year-olds that are doctors mm -hmm. and then highly gifted, um, pretty much understood that. Um, so what is the, when you say the talent development population, you know, that's that, you know, 25% line that we looked around, across um, that should be. So what, in, in terms of instruction mm -hmm. and programming for students, what exactly, what does that look like? The, and like, is your student going to be like, you know, gifted that, you know, like maybe 120 and above, but maybe not just super crazy high scores somewhere, but obviously in the gifted range, um, like, let's tell, like, what does that look like as far as the student profile? What does it look like as far as programming? So, and I think the important thing to me is that the, the, the 12 to 25% pool, if you will, like this dark teal range here, um, there's a lot of teal on here. So we'll go with green, this low green range right here. Those are your really bright kids. They might not be your 120 kids. They're gonna be your kids who might be really, really gifted in math, but not so much the average in English ELA. They might be your kids who are amazing writers, but math is eh. Um, they might be your kids who they just don't test well. And so all the testing data that we have isn't going to do squat for them because they don't test well. Um, these could be the kids who have never been encouraged to show their creative sides. And so they don't know how to express some of those really deep level thoughts that they have. And so for instruction, 
I think there's there's a couple of different things that you can do. Um, and some of it we'll get into later in the course when we actually get into more instructional strategies. Um, but providing opportunities for, for creative thinking, providing opportunities for creative reasoning, um, critical thinking skills and like challenging the questions, having students write complex questions and answer complex questions, um, using any type of shared inquiry. Um, I think one of the things that we really tried to focus on when we wrote the ELC curriculum for elementary school, in terms of how we're supporting our students, the 25% is kind of our target range for that enriched curriculum because, you know, we do shared inquiry, we, we do things like Jacob's Ladder, where the purpose of it is to scaffold and build up their students' talents and strengths and abilities. Um, but they might, some of them are already there and some of them need to be scaffolded to get there. And so, and that could be another way we, to look at it is if this kid had just a little more help or a little more support, they would thrive in that above level class. So are we providing those scaffolds for them to get there? Um, and I think we've said, you know, when we look at like the concept of UDL and graphic organizers, I think are the thing like, 10, 20 years ago, not everybody did graphic organizers. We all did outlines. And then we got into graphic organizers and now graphic organizers, almost everybody does. And we don't have it as quite like the specialty thing. Um, and it's kind of that same idea, like graphic organizers work for a lot of different people. Mind maps work for people. There's different ways to approach questioning that help kids think in different ways. And so that's what you're doing with your talent development is you're finding ways to identify what their talents are and then how do you use them as a strength to build up their other types of learning. All right, and I think my other questions were more about um, UDL that being driven by Hyatt versus someone versus people who are instructional specialists and also um, point of access. But I will ask that in the next module when you talk about instructional strategies. I'll try to remember. That and, and I think, you know, an important thing to with stop the line. I think something that's important is that our Hyatt team has taken the lead on UDL, which is amazing because they have special training in it. There's a whole nother, their CPD courses offered for it. They have paid courses they offer with it. Um, but UDL is not just a special education thing. It's a general education framework that makes instruction more accessible for everybody. And so I think, and if you guys are taking this class with me, you probably already know this, but I think one of the, the challenges is, you know, the same thing with assistive technology, because it comes out of our special education office, sometimes it gets confused as a um, special education thing. And really it's about it's about making life more accessible for our special education students, but it's not just a special education thing. Um, I will read the question in the chat and digest that in a moment, um, but I did want to give you some time. Sorry, I'm just flipping through to make sure there was nothing else that really All of that is really just if you want to know about the um, what the laws around professional development and learning are for learning about giftedness. Um, so, so I did want to put you guys in breakout rooms for about 10 minutes um, to talk through one or more of these questions. And um, I was just going to throw them out to random groups unless you guys have something specific you want to group with. I hear no preference. How many do I have? 40. That seems like a good number. All right. I am going to send you guys out. And I will um, broadcast out the questions.
So I don't know if you guys are all having the wind gusts that I am having, but if I get knocked off line, I'm just going to go ahead and apologize now. I have above line or above ground power cables to the house and a really big tree outside. So whenever I get cut off, that's it for the day. Melinda has a baby. And Marina has a baby. Oh, we should have bring her baby to school day. Um, so is there anything that you guys uh, talked about? Um, Asma, that is a great question. Um, I, I actually did a talk with um, um, Manal. Why am I breaking on Manal's last name? She was at White Oak for forever. Anyway, she came and did a whole talk on the struggle that Arab Americans have with how they identify themselves. Um, and so it really actually is completely person dependent on how they choose to identify because as it was explained to me you know some especially like i believe she's egyptian and so it was like you know her family is from like africa but if she puts down african-american people you know she doesn't look what people would expect to look and that's not really the culture she identifies with but if she puts down white then she has a very similar issue and so my general understanding is that people will self-identify and um, they're, and then they're lumped into our categories based on how they identify. Um, but we don't have a separate breakout. Um, whether or not we should is an amazing like thought discussion to have, but it's not something that we have in MCPS right now. So um, I don't have a better answer and I hate it when I don't have a better answer, but I at least have an explanatory, not great answer. I totally understand. It's just I'm Egyptian as well. And I just wanted to like, I was just curious as what it was because above the Sahara versus below the Sahara is a big controversial right. topic. I mean, and, and then it gets into so many pieces and not to even like completely like steal the conversation for but I will for a moment just you know, as a Jewish person who doesn't think of myself as like mainstream white, like I'm aware I'm white, but my culture is very different than, and especially growing up or living for a long period of time down in the South, I was very definitely different from everybody else and they made sure I knew it all the time. Um, and so, you know, when we get to that like cultural identity versus racial identity versus ethnic identity, and then from the data perspective, then I really want to break down the data and really dig into like what things look like um but unfortunately we're just not we're not set up to do that particularly in mcps i do feel like there's some research because i know there's a lot of um work being done in i'm gonna go with like that middle eastern area around gifted education in other countries and it's and specifically in the middle east i haven't done a lot of reading about it but if it's something you're interested in there's there's research out there for sure i just I'm not overly familiar with it. Thank you so much. So I know we're running up to the buzzer like we always do, but if, did anybody have anything they wanted to bring back to the group or questions that came out? Um, or even questions that we just want to kind of throw out there or um, anything you want me to look into that I can bring back for another meeting? Gary. Hey, I just wanted to share that in my group, um, one thing that got brought up, um, and, and it's so very true, is that we think that there are a lot of our emergent multilingual learners who are, are vastly under-identified, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're not fluent in English, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if we're basing, you know, whether or not we think they're gifted on their ability to test and, and perform in a second or third language, um, then we're really not testing their intellectual capacity. 100%. Um, one of my biggest arguments, and, and those of you who know me know, I'm not typically a brand name kind of person. Like I'll speak generally about, you know, well, I only ever remember the name of the WISC, but I say WISC and others like it because I never remember. Um, but, you know, we have our aptitude tests, we have our educational tests. 
like I said, I'm not a huge like brand name person test, but there is a new version of the Navalieri nonverbal assessment. It's not the NNAT, that's the old one. The new one that has come out um, is very nonverbal. Like there's no, even the directions are not verbal. Um, it's all visual. And we'll put my blind students aside for a second because obviously we got other things to work with there. Um, but they specifically designed this one and, and um, they specifically designed it to address that for kids who might speak five languages and one of them is not English. They should not be hampered. I mean, the fact they speak five languages should be noted as, you know, somebody who's probably verbally and linguistically inclined and possibly gifted, but, but the entire concept of it is to take out that verbal piece so that we can, you know, look at, at different ways, look at comprehension, look at different nonverbals. Um, we are advocating really hard for that to be our new assessment for our screening process. There's there's a lot of things. It's a new test that it's only been given for the last like couple of years. I want to say two or three years. And so some of the issues have to do with like norming and other things. Um, but it's something that we're very excited about. And our hope is that really, I mean, right now, especially our EMLs are so under identified because we're only primarily using performance data and checklists. So if a parent doesn't know to fill out the checklist, even though it, it is available in multiple languages, but that doesn't necessarily make it easier. Um, if a teacher isn't sure because they're not seeing what they would anticipate seeing in a gifted student, so they don't know how to fill out the checklist, and then they're not performing well in like ELA, that's going to knock them out before we really even get to know who they are as learners. Now, students who are identified as an EML one maybe two, I don't recall, in the year that they're screened, they will automatically become a rescreen, meaning that they don't have to be screened or if we screen them and they don't make it, they're automatically rescreened when we get to the next age level. Um, but that's not a solution. It's just sometimes delaying the problem. But it is something that we're aware of and um, if we have chance for work groups and you guys are interested, I'll, I'll get that information out to people for sure. Bev. Um, that was a really good topic that you guys brought up because um, the language part. So even if you are possibly screening them with a nonverbal um, test, mm -hmm. um, so much of um, what I hear a lot of, even in the possibly twice exceptional area, the kids that do have similar disabilities, but they also have a lot of skills, mm -hmm. um, is that they need to be able to do all these language-based things. And I work with, with kids with varying levels of um, skills who have autism, and that is they're in particularly impacted by language, mm -hmm. either express, usually expressive language. Um, they can understand so much more than what they can express. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear a lot of, well, um, if we give them this enriched activity or if we do this, they have to be able to explain X, Y, Z. And if they can't do that, then, 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 they're not right for that level of instruction or if they're not right for that type of enrichment. Um, the, the language part of it being what's going to, how they're gonna prove themselves. And I just feel like that's so unfair to the kids with expressive language difficulties. That's so unfair to the kids who um, just are, are new to the language and cannot articulate themselves like that. There's so much more to abstract thinking mm -hmm. and demonstrating that abstract thinking than being able to explain something in a certain way. Absolutely. And I mean, it actually, when you said this, it reminded me of a student that I had um, and I had him for three years, but I followed him beyond that even. And um he had autism. He was with me in, in our bridge program. 
and he could not explain how characters were feeling or what they were doing or anything, but he was an amazing artist and the expressions he could draw on the faces of the, and so I used to have him do storyboarding when we were talking about character interaction. So before he would write any type of essay or before he would do a narrative, I'd have him storyboard it because he would put so much time into creating expressions on the faces that it helped me understand that, yeah, actually he was getting it. And maybe not to the extent that, that some of the other kids in the class were, and his writing was not, you know, that same level of expression. He used a lot of, of simplistic language. Um, at the same time, he was also an amazing decoder and like his scores on the woodcock and his scores on anything I did in the classroom were amazing. Like I don't even have another word for it. Like his goal was to always do a cold reading perfectly. And he made one mistake one time, I was very upset about it. Um, but it didn't always, you know, impact those other places, but by letting him draw, by letting him, you know, pull things together and, and do more visual expression. And then if he explained it, he was usually more simplistic about it, but it was the language that was simple, not the thinking. And I think that that was one of those, I, ha I had another student also with autism who, again, he, he struggled with some of that communication. Um, I was lucky, he was one of those kids who also had perfect pitch. And so at one point we were doing something with Shakespeare and his performance, he walked around my classroom in circles, but every character he sang and he had a different tune, a different pitch, a different cadence, and he did like a whole scene out of Midsummer all by himself. Could he have told me all the nuanced feelings that everybody was having? No, not in the least, but he showed me and he was able to perform for me to show that he understood the relationship between Puck and Oberon and then when Titania comes in and he had all these different pieces it wasn't an essay. He didn't necessarily get a great score on the essay, but for me to understand that he knew what we were talking about and that he could, you know, explain some of those other pieces that we do along the way, it's not always about the final written response, even in English. And I think that that's that's the that UDL piece. That's yes. what that's the UDL piece. That's not getting and 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 the whole thing again about putting it on the IEP and then making sure that that people understand. Well, what is it that you are? What is it that you're trying to get out of them? Do you want them to explain it? Do you want them to explain it? Or do you want them to demonstrate understanding? And that, and that sometimes is, is the question to ask. Because if I need to know that you understood the content, that's a lot different than needing to explain what it is that you are telling me. So. So we have not done in view for a couple of years now. Um, in view, one of the reasons that we stopped doing in view is because it was a test that you could prep for. And it wasn't initially. And even though all of these are supposed to be, you know, um, intelligence tests that measure students' abilities, the fact of the matter is that if you know what's on the test and you know how to prepare for it, you have an edge because you're not surprised by what you're seeing. And so um, we stopped doing the interview. It's also why we're not looking at the end that um, even the code that was something that can be prepped for, um, not as easily as some of the others, but any of those things that like testing mom or whatever will like sell courses on gives an unfair advantage to those who can afford for that. And again, it's about, you know, when it's a time test and you get used to like the timing of the test and all those are things that really impact scores. And so it's the reason that we stopped using InView. Um, Kogat was a whole different thing. And then, like I said, now we're looking at the new Negliari. So hopefully we'll get back to having cognitive testing to measure giftedness and other cognitive performance at some point. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording.